Thank you, Brother John, for that. I'm so glad that God's grace is greater than sin. You don't have to be perfect to come to First Baptist Church. It's a good thing, because I wouldn't be here then. And Jesus says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I'm glad you're here this morning. If you've never been touched by the grace of God in your life, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and believed on him, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you can trust him today. And he'll save you. He'll take away your sins. And he promises you a home in heaven forever. But beyond that, along the way, he says, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, this morning, about 9 o'clock after the TV broadcast was done, a gentleman phoned to the church and said this morning that he had watched the broadcast and he prayed the prayer and asked Jesus to save him. He asked me to send him that book, and that was a wonderful blessing. People are saving. Thanks for your generosity in helping support that ministry. Right after that phone call, another one came in from a lady, and she said, uh, that pastor preaches way too much on politics. <laughs> I could tell by the way he was speaking who he voted for, and if he doesn't apologize next week, I'm not going to send the church any more money. Well, you can't win them all. <laughs> and uh, it keeps us humble, does it not? But I'm glad that God's grace, all right, is greater than all our sin. I'm glad you're here this morning. The church is supposed to be a place that everyone can come. Everyone is welcome at First Baptist Church. No matter how much money you make or how much you owe, you're welcome here at First Baptist Church. No matter how you look, you're welcome at First Baptist Church. No matter what you've done, you're welcome at First Baptist Church. Someone said it this way, that the church is supposed to be a spiritual hospital. And a hospital does not turn away sick people. A hospital welcomes sick people and helps get them out the doors spiritually well. That's what we're here for, to give you the truth from God's Word. No matter how you come in, we're glad you're here. And I hope you feel welcome here at First Baptist Church, whether you've been here five minutes or 500 minutes, All right? We're glad you're here at First Baptist Church. If you have your Bibles, please open to Deuteronomy chapter number 6 this morning. As we continue on our theme this year, only God. Only God. You see, we are tempted, we are tested to replace God in our life. We've been looking the last few weeks at what it means to have only God in our life. No other gods before him only God, a pursuit in our life, only God. This morning, I'd like to turn our attention to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Familiar passage in the Jewish culture and Jewish religion. Relatively familiar passage to most Christians. Some powerful statements, some powerful truths found here in the book of Deuteronomy given to the Israelites by Moses, but given to believers from God himself. All scriptures give by inspiration of God and is profitable. Deuteronomy chapter 6, please look at with me in verse number 4, beginning in verse 4. The Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Powerful, powerful statement that is. Statement of faith, a statement of belief, statement of doctrine. The Lord our God is one Lord. There's not multi. Now, he's a trinity, three parts, but he is one God, and he is the only God. He is the only true God. He's creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of life and the giver of life. Only God. We are here because of the Lord who is one God. Powerful statement of faith. You need to know that God is one God. He ought to be your God. You think of a statement of faith. I think of that song that Brother Dalton sings, We Believe. Yes. It's a good song, and you enjoy that, don't you? Yes. Would you like to hear it today? Yes. I have it on good authority. It's scheduled for the evening service. <laughs> so come back tonight, and you'll hear it. You say, well, I'll go online. We'll block that part of the service right then. We'll <laughs> mute it for you. Well, make it like a lot of young people. Mom, your mouth's moving, but I'm not hearing anything. No, he's supposed to sing that tonight, the good Lord willing, and now the pressure's on, Brother Dalton. So you get a good nap today, drink lots of water, and uh, look forward to that. But it's a powerful song, is it not? A statement, what we believe. There, that statement, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, you could take that statement, you could put it over the door frame of your house, so as you walk out of the house, you know that that God is one God, and hopefully he's your God. 
Your family is God, not a multiplicity of gods, just one God. The verse goes on, though, because of that, verse number 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Interesting that God, after he establishes the fact that he is God, does not establish the fear. He establishes love. He does not say, I'm the, the one God, now therefore fear me. He says, the Lord our God is one Lord, so love him. Love him. Even though love has been hijacked in our, in our current time, we still understand and at a base level know what true love is. People want to redefine love. They want it to be somewhat selfishly centered and motivated. If you love, it's for your sake. I love food. I love pizza. Selfishly motivated. True love is other motivated. Read 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 of the actions of love. It's not for me. It's for other people, for someone else. And God, after he establishes that he is the one Lord, he says, now, what you're supposed to do is to love me with all your heart, soul, and might. Verse number 6. And these words, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. A Jew who is following this exactly will have a small portion of Scripture. They would even bind in a box on their head to exactly follow what God said here. I would submit the point is not to have it in a box on my head before my eyes, phylactery, but to have it in front of my eyes so my steps please Him. Amen. You see, the Word of God is not to be just something I read, though I hope you read it every single day. We're asking for testimonies about what God is doing. A few weeks back, I asked for commitments if people would commit to spend the next 21 days in God's Word every single day, and over 250 uh, people committed to do that. What an encouragement to the pastor here at First Baptist Church to me, but I'm hearing testimony of that now. And, and if God has touched you, we're going to ask that you'd share that with others. It'll encourage people's hearts. Stories about how people who have not read the Bible before, but now reading it, and God's touching their heart. The point is not just so it's stuck to my head, all right? so that my life is stuck to it, frontlets before my eyes. Verse 9, And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware... Beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Lord, I thank you for this scripture, for the truths found here. Lord, I ask you to help us these next few moments. Help our hearts to be open to the truth from your word. Lord, help me as I speak. I need you this morning. Lord, fill me and control me by your spirit. Lord, I ask that our hearts would be tender and you would touch us today, that you'd meet with us inside this place where we're trying to honor you. Help us to leave in response to you that is in obedience to you. And Lord, I ask that there's someone here who's never trusted you as their Savior, that today would be the day they trust you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all you've done and what you're doing here. Lord, bless this time now. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 12 is a powerful passage of Scripture. Powerful. Great truths found in here. Uh, many sermons throughout this, and I may preach a number of them from this passage. Some truth on, on raising and, and training children in, in godly paths. And, and parents, we need to train our children in the right path. Heaven forbid that we teach them how to navigate life, but not to navigate heaven. Heaven forbid that they can change the oil, but they don't know how to change spiritually speaking. 
Heaven forbid that they know how to manage their money, but don't know how to manage their life for Jesus Christ. We as parents have a tremendous responsibility as grandparents, as Christians, a responsibility to train other people, teach them to observe all things, whatever God has commanded and taught us. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20. He says it here in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Our responsibility is to give the truth from God's word to everyone else. Tremendous, great responsibility. But that's not where we're going this morning. There's some, uh, some application, like I mentioned, about how our life needs to be uh, following God's word, but that's not where we're going this morning. Tremendous truth in verse number five about how we should wholly, completely follow God. But that's not where we're going this morning. I want us, if we could, to look just in verse number four this morning. Something very important, small but vitally important. Do you know that sometimes it's the small things that can change the most? Your paycheck probably has a little decimal point in it, does it not? Where that decimal point is placed can change and rearrange your day. Moving it this way or this way for you, a few spaces makes you sad. Move it the other way makes you happy. In English language, punctuation can change things. A small thing can change so much, like a little comma. Let's eat, Grandma, becomes let's eat, Grandma. The small things can be vitally important. You know, it's the small things that can also irritate us the most. Maybe you've been injured or maybe you've broken a foot or a bone before, and that can be painful. But how about an eyelash stuck in your eye? How awful is that? Or a piece of sawdust. When I was younger in high school, I wore contacts. Whatever happened, my eyes became better. I had 20, 40, and 20, 60 vision in high school. I now have 20, 15, and 20, 10, depending on the eye. I don't know what happened, but my eyes got better. I wore contacts in high school, and one night I was trying to take out one of my contacts, and it rolled up into my eye. For me, very painful. Probably the most pain I've ever experienced, worse than having a child. No doubt about that. <laughs> I'll hear about that later on. Don't you worry. I had heard the horror stories about how these contacts can stick in there and then they cause an infection, you lose your eye. All right? I don't know why they tell you these things, especially to a high schooler. All right, boy, take this out every night or, or next thing you know, you'll be in here, we'll be you know, removing your eye. And boy, I was, so my parents took me to the ER. They began to try to find this contact and they dyed my eye. They put a 14 billion candle watt light right above my head, you know, burned me all the way through the back of my skull. Contact just rolled up there, irritating frustrating. Can't really reach for it. You know, hey, give me that knife. I'll get that contact out. You can't do that. It's the small things that can really change a day. It's interesting how that someone can cut you off in traffic, a small thing, and you can be irritated the rest of the day. One unkind word can, can change your entire disposition. Small things can change so much they're, they're vital. And equally as true, a small thing can bring tremendous benefit. You see, we are good as Christians at a few things. We are good at looking like Christians. You know how to hold ourselves just right. You know when to stand up and sit down. You know how to have a nice somber face. You need a somber face and a plaster of fake smile on the outside. You have a plaster of fake smile. You know what to do at church. You know when to come and when to leave. But God is not looking just for Christians who can look good on the outside. We are even excellent at communicating that we're Christians. Well, you know, I'm going to pray about that, Pastor. I'm going to pray about that. And sometimes no intention of doing that at all. It never happens. You know how to agree. We're professional agreeers. But God is not looking for just those who agree. God is not looking just for those who come. And God is not looking just for those who will listen. Look with me, please, in verse number 4 of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6. It 
This morning, I want to draw your attention to just one word, and it's the first word. You see it there? Would you say it with me? It says, here. One more time, it says, here. here. Interesting word we find there. The word in Hebrew is Shema. Interesting word. We read that and we say, oh, hear, O Israel. If we use the word hear, we usually mean to, to listen up. Hear this to my children, to the congregation. I want you to listen to what I'm saying in a classroom setting. But this word in Hebrew has so much more so much more depth than just the word here. I want to talk about this word this morning and give us some application because of this word here. The word here does not just mean here. There is so much more at stake in this little word because when we hear the word here, we think of it as just allowing sound waves to bounce off our eardrums. When we hear the word here, we mean listen, listen to what I'm saying. All right, now, now shake them or rattle them here. And there is a truth inside of that where we can't stop our ears to, to what God has for us. We have to pay attention. But the word here, Shema in Hebrew, has the expectation that someone will listen and someone will do. When God says to the children of Israel, hear, he means you hear this, now do this. See, the problem is Christians. We hear. I'm listening. If I were to ask what I preached, well, I won't ask that question. I'll be disappointed, all right? <laughs> I knew one pastor who preached the same message, I mean, five or six times in a row, and finally someone said, Pastor, I think you preached that before. <laughs> but you hear, you listen, you, many of you, read God's word. But that's not the expectation. The expectation is not to end right there and just allow it to come in and allow it to, to bounce off your ears and, and bounce around in your heart and mind. The expectation is to hear and to do something about it. I'm going to give you some passages to support this. Throughout the, New, the Old Testament, you'll find the way this word, what it means and, and how it works. Adam and Eve did this in Genesis chapter 3. In verse number 8, the Bible says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The Bible says they heard that voice. They had just sinned. They had just taken of the, of the fruit they were not supposed to eat. They had just disobeyed God, and now God showed up. They heard the voice, all right, and the Bible says, And they, Adam and his wife, hid themselves. They heard it. And they did something about it. They did not just say, oh, God's coming. Oh, oh. They said, uh-oh, God's coming. There's a problem. I've got to do something. Not only Adam and Eve, you find it with the story of Jacob and Leah, his first wife in Genesis chapter 29. The wives are having children left and right. The Bible says that Leah hadn't had the children for a while. And she prayed and and then she had a son, and she called him Simeon. Simeon, one of the tribes of Israel, Simeon. But the Bible tells us this, and it says that she bare a son, and she said, because the Lord hath heard Shema, because the Lord hath heard, he hath therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon, which is really Shimon, using that same Shema. Because the Lord had heard, he did this. The expectation was not just that God would hear, but that God would hear and do something about this. David did this same thing. David pled in Psalm chapter 27, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. You see, when, God, uh, when David prays to God, he doesn't just say, Lord, hear me, but he said, Lord, hear with the expectation that God will do something about it. Shema, Lord, hear when I cry. We know this. We operate this way in many different scenarios. You operate this way with your children and they with you. When your baby is crying, can't quite speak yet, 
They don't want you just to hear them. They want you to do something about it. Our first son, Johnny, was quite the crier, the non-sleeper. No complaints, just fact. It's amazing we had another child after Johnny. We still say that same thing. Boy, he could cry and, my, how he would stop when mom would pick him up. Didn't like dad so much. Smart kid. Wouldn't have mattered if I had walked in there or Dreen walked in there and said, okay, hello, I hear you, right? No, the child is crying, the baby is crying, and he wants a response, an expectation. As a dad, I want an expectation. Hey, kids, it's Wednesday, it's trash day, take the trash out. Okay, dad, we heard you. No, 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 you didn't hear me. All right, because you're not outside yet. We know this. We, we have this expectation that when, when we give instruction and authority, this like sense that someone will respond to it. And God uses this word, Shema, hear, O Israel, an expectation that something would take place. And my friend, there are many Christians, there are many people in this world who just hear God. They allow it to bounce around their ears, to bounce around inside their heart, but there is no change. It might as well go in one ear and out the other. And that is not the way, my friend, that this is supposed to work. Shema. Hear, O Israel. You see, we understand how this works in a pretty broad sense. But God brings it to us. He asks us for a response. You see, every time that God's word is open, every time that we read God's word, every time that God's word is preached, there will be a response. There will be a choice. We will either refuse it or we'll obey it. Every single time. Famous quarterback, Roger Staubach. Played for the Dallas Cowboys. They won championship in 71. He admitted that his position as quarterback was tough because he wasn't allowed to call his own signals. He said that Coach Landry sent in every play. That Coach Landry, his coach, told Roger Staubach when to pass, when to run, and only in emergency situations could he change the play. And if he changed the play, quote, you better be right. Roger said that even though he considered Coach to be a genius mind, when it came to football strategy, pride was hard for him. Roger later said, I faced the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. You see, the truth is, we know that in comparison to God, we're nothing. We know He's smarter than us. We know He's greater than us. He's more powerful than we are. He has a different and a better perspective than we have. But understand, my friend, that until we learn to obey and to hear, not just hear, but to hear, we will not reap the blessings that God has for us, we'll not see the path that God has for us. You see, this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible says, hear, O Israel. And I say this morning to First Baptist Church, hear, First Baptist Church. Don't just hear it here, but hear it here and make the decisions to follow. We have two choices. We can obey it or we can refuse it. In Zechariah chapter 7, we have an example where a prophet comes to the children of Israel. And they began to refuse, they have refused what God said. What it says there in Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 11, it says, But they refused to hearken. They refused to hear. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear. He's not just talking about hearing, he's talking about hearing. And he says, the Bible says that when you stop obeying, stop following God, that there that your heart becomes like a stone. We say it this way, you have a hard heart. 
But we don't believe that as Christians. We say, I don't have a hard heart. I'm in church every week, Pastor. I don't have a hard heart. I, I open up God's Word every day. I don't have a hard heart. You see, I, I, I sing when, when they say to sing, and I even smile and I sing loud. I don't have a hard heart. And God says, it's not enough just to show up. You have a hard heart when you refuse to do what God has asked you to do. When you refuse to obey what God has said to do, when you refuse to respond when God touches your heart. That time when God says to apologize and you don't, you now have a hard heart. When God says to give and you don't, you have a hard heart. When God says to respond at invitation time and you don't, you have a hard heart. We refuse to apologize. We refuse to get right. We refuse to give. We refuse to use our, our talents for the Lord. We refuse to pattern our life after His Word. We refuse to follow the leading in our life. We refuse to listen to the clear teaching from the Scripture. It equals a hard heart. We can refuse a few different ways. We can refuse by ignoring. We can refuse by abstaining and we can refuse by delaying. All equal refusal. A man read about, used to have a problem with his son. His story, the problem would be he couldn't get his son to clean his room. He said, I would insist that he do it now, and he would always agree to do it, but then he wouldn't follow through, at least not right away. In the New Testament, Jesus talks about two servants. One servant the master said, or two sons, I'm sorry. One son, the master said, listen, go to the field. And the one son said, I'll go. But he never went. He said to the other son, you go to the field. And that son said, no, I will not go. But later repented and went to the field. Jesus asked the question, which one obeyed the father? His point was the one who went. It doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you do. You can say, I'm following God, but if you're not following God, then you're not following God. Seems pretty simple, doesn't it? Well, his dad said I had a trouble getting him to follow through, at least right away. After high school, the young man joined the Marine Corps. My dad said that after he got out of boot camp and graduated from boot camp, they're coming back on leave and they're on the same airplane. The son said this, Dad, my life makes sense now. Everything you said, you did when I was growing up now makes sense. I really, really understand. And by the way, Dad, I finally learned what now means. <laughs> Whether because of doubt, discouragement, delay, or defiance, rejection of God's word is always disobedience. My friend, this morning as we come to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with only God, as we focus in 2021 on only God, make sure that when God speaks, you don't refuse it. And you don't have to shake your fist to refuse it. You can just say, I'll do it later. You can just say, hmm, I'm not so sure. Anything other than obedience is refusal, rejection of God's word. You can refuse it or you can obey it. You can obey it. You can receive what he says and respond to what he says. An old country preacher said it this way, Brethren, whatever God tells me to do in this blessed book, I'm going to do. If I see in it that I must jump through a stone wall, I'm going to jump at it. Going through the wall belongs to God. Jumping at it belongs to me. A lot of truth in that. You see, in our life, God will speak to us, and he will ask of us things that will appear to be jumping through a stone wall. And we'll make up a whole bunch of excuses why we can't jump through that stone wall. And the fact is, we can't jump through the stone wall. We can't do anything. Jesus says, without me, ye can do nothing. But my response ought to be to obey his word, to listen and to obey God expects us to obey him and blesses us as we do, to concentrate on it and carry it out, to listen to it and live by it, to catch it and comply, to receive and to respond. Back in Exodus, the Lord used this word to the children of Israel. He said, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice and keep my covenant. The next is chapter 19. If you look up in the Hebrew what that means, or those words that were used, the Lord says, if you will shema and shema. He put two of them together. 
And he says, listen, not just once but twice for some emphasis. If you will do both of these things, he says to the children of Israel, you will be a peculiar treasure. You'll be special above all people for all the earth is mine. You see, there's no separation from listening and doing and listening and obeying here. God says, if you hear me, you have to obey. The point of this is only God. Love him with all of me. I can't love anything else more. Love him and I'll listen and obey. Love him and I'll follow him. Some of the hymns we sing ought to be rewritten. I surrender all. We could rewrite, I surrender some. Oh, how I love Jesus ought to be penned, oh, how I like Jesus. I love to tell the story. We ought to say, I love to talk about telling the story. The great song, Take My Life and Let It Be. We could write, take my life and let me be. Where he leads, I will follow. We could say, where he leads, I'll consider following. He's a missionary. In that culture, he's having trouble giving this concept of obedience, following God. Until one day, on the way home in the village, there was a dog there, and he whistled at the dog, and his dog came running. And an old native said to the missionary, he said, the translation, dog yours, ears is only. And the missionary said, well, what does that mean? And the man translated it this way, your dog is all ear. Or your dog listens only to you. And when you whistle, he comes. My friend, as Christians, I want my ear to be all his. Only his. This morning, Shema, hear, so that my ear is tuned to him. Not so I can say, oh, I heard God, but so I can follow God. Does God have your ear? When God speaks, do you obey? Does God have your attention, not only listen, but obey. Often in our life, we know what God wants. The problem is not a knowing problem. It's a doing problem. Shema, here. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the truth from your word. Lord, the fact that we must not only listen and hear you, but obey and do. Lord, help us this morning. Lord, maybe there's someone here who has heard what you've said, Lord, but never followed you, not following you. Lord, help us to be tender. May our ears be turned towards you, Lord. May our hearts be in tune with you. Who would say this morning, Pastor, with heads bowed and eyes closed, Pastor, as you spoke, God's been speaking to me. I know what I'm supposed to do, and and God spoke to me. I've heard it, but I've I've not done it. Would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? God spoke to me. I don't know, I don't want to just hear, but I need to do as well. Who else? Amen. Hands all over. Who else? I heard this morning. God spoke to me. I hear, but I need to hear the way God says. Amen. Amen. Who else? Hands all over. What if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior? Who would say, Pastor, as you spoke, something was going on in my heart. And if I died right now, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Who would say, that's me, Pastor? Would say, would you pray for me? I ask you, just slip your hand up. I won't draw any more attention to you than I did anyone else. Who would say, that's me, Pastor? I'm not sure. I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Christ. Would you pray for me this morning? Just slip your hand up. Slip it down and I'll see it. Lord, you've seen these hands. Lord, more importantly, you know the hearts. We can fool each other, but Lord, we can't fool you. And Lord, I pray this morning that our hearts would be honest. Lord, that if we hear you, that we'll do what you ask us to do. Lord, many indicated that they've been dealt with by you. And Lord, I ask this morning that they would do business with you this morning, give them the strength to follow you. Lord, and as you speak to us, may we obey and do what you ask us. Lord, bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.